we hear way too many stories about children who are failed by the system. Children who are born to abusive, neglectful parents who prove time and time again that the children are in danger under their care, yet they are not removed from the home and nothing is done until it's far too late. That's usually how it goes, but not in this case. This case is even more disturbing than that. This case involves a child born into a family unfit to raise her. She is sent to a loving foster home, but soon after, a monster disguised as a woman steps in and insists on caring for the little girl. And almost immediately, she is murdered. Why? How did this happen? How did the system miss so many red flags? We may have some of those answers as we progress throughout this case, but no matter how you spin this story, you will be left with even more questions than answers. It's heartbreaking, it's tragic, and simply unbelievable. But before we get into the case, just a quick note. I know I sound stuffy and congested. I've been fighting a cold the past week. I feel fine. Honestly, I felt fine. I thought it was allergies, but because of how long it's lasted, I'm pretty sure it's a cold, but I just have a lot of congestion up in my nose. Makes me sound a little bit different, but otherwise I feel fine. So I do apologize in advance for how my voice sounds, but there's really nothing I can do about it. But without any further delay, let's get into the case. Today, we will be discussing the horrific case of Layla Daniel. Layla Marie Daniel was born on July 18th, 2013 to parents Tessa Clendending and Anthony Daniel in Hampton, Georgia, and she had an older sister named Millie. Layla was known as being the sweetest little girl with a big, loving smile. She loved everyone and would always tell people around her that she's a big girl. She loved eating chicken nuggets, playing with her toy kitchen, and watching the show Yo Gabba Gabba. But Layla was no stranger to chaos in her very short life. At first, Layla and her sister Millie lived with their mother Tessa. However, Tessa was known to struggle with drug abuse from the time that she was a teenager. Tessa was known, to put it bluntly, as being a neglectful mother. She would leave her young daughters unsupervised at times. When they weren't home alone, they were being moved from house to house, living with different family members for short periods of time while she went out and did drugs, mostly meth. Other times, Tessa would even leave the girls with people she had only known for a short period of time, and obviously, that is very dangerous, leaving your children with someone that you hardly know, you don't know what their intentions are, or if they could be bad people who want to harm your children. Meanwhile, Anthony Daniel was in and out of jail, never really being a part of his daughter's lives. Their lives were unstable, unpredictable, and chaotic. Meanwhile, DCFS was on Tessa's tail for a long time, but each time they would receive a complaint and would show up to Tessa's residence, she would slam the door in their faces. Rather than following up and forcing Tessa to cooperate, they would just close the case. Another time when they opened a case, Tessa moved to North Carolina, not leaving a forwarding address. So, once again, DCFS closed the case. They were pretty much telling her that if she just didn't cooperate and made things really hard for them, that they would just leave her alone. That is not the end of the failures of the system in this case, but we will get more into that later in the video. By January of 2015, Tessa was charged with conspiracy to distribute meth. After her case was tried, she spent three months in jail. Then, finally, by April of 2015, the Department of Family and Child Services stepped in and removed Layla and Millie from the care of their mother, and from there, they were placed into foster care. At the time, Layla was 21 months old, so almost two, and Millie was four years old. At first, the girls were placed with a couple named Patricia and Dexter Lambert, who were foster parents working with the system. They were experienced, competent foster parents by all accounts, but they were strangers to the girls and Tessa. Now, as a child, Tessa had been in the foster care system herself. As a child, she had briefly lived with another girl, Jennifer Rosenbaum. Jennifer was a third-year law student interning at the juvenile court in Henry County, which shared the courts with DCFS cases. Well, while working there, she found out that Tessa's two girls were taken and put into the foster system. She talked to Tessa's grandmother, the girl's great-grandmother, briefly, and the interaction just stuck with her. 
those little girls were in need of help. So she decided she wanted to step in. Although her and Tessa were never the best of friends, she did spend a bit of time with her growing up and she knew that she could provide better care for those girls than foster parents could. Knowing what the system was like, she didn't want those little girls to suffer like she did. So, by May of 2015, 26-year-old Jennifer Rosenbaum sent Tessa a Facebook message offering to take Layla and Millie into her care. She explained how she found out about the situation to begin with, saying that her girls were just so beautiful, they looked just like their mom. Now, when she messaged Tessa, it went to the request box because they weren't actually friends on Facebook yet. But Tessa found out from the girl's case manager, Samantha White, that Jennifer was interested in taking the girls. Jennifer had expressed to Samantha that she had empathy for what Tessa was going through and she knew how tough the situation was. So, after finding out that there was a potential interest in the girls, Tessa went on Facebook and found the message so she could send a message back. Now, at the time, Tessa didn't necessarily remember Jennifer all that well. Again, they had lived together briefly, but they were never like best friends or sisters or anything like that. But she took a look at Jennifer's Facebook photos and what she saw was a put together woman. She was married, dressed well, and had a home and a dog. She felt that if Jennifer remembered her and wanted to help, then she must be a good person. It felt almost like a message from God that someone wanted to help her and cared enough to take her babies in. Even though Tessa did have a very rough past and did not take care of her children the way they deserved, Tessa still cared about her girls and still wanted what was best for them. And by all accounts, what Tessa saw on Facebook was true. Jennifer was put together. In high school, she was a part of the Georgia National Guard and then was accepted into Clayton State University for undergrad. After that, she attended Emory University School of Law, where she was known as a hard worker and took on a no-nonsense attitude. Like I said, at the time, she was a third-year law student. She had aspirations in politics, actually announcing herself as a candidate for Henry County's District 1 commission seat in the upcoming election. She had big aspirations for herself. Jennifer was someone who pulled herself out of a difficult situation, which was foster care, and she was making a good life for herself. She was intelligent, hardworking, and very involved in her community. Meanwhile, Jennifer's husband, Joseph, who worked as a corrections officer, was born with a severe and fatal genetic disease called cystic fibrosis. This is a condition that is caused by a genetic defect that causes the mucus in the respiratory system to become thick and sticky. This causes incredible difficulty to breathe and requires lifelong treatments to manage. Because of this, even though Joseph and Jennifer had always wanted to raise a family, they didn't want children of their own. They didn't necessarily want to pass on this disease to a child. Not that they would definitely get it, but obviously there was a pretty big chance that the child would get cystic fibrosis. But again, they wanted children, and throughout Joseph's time battling this disease, Jennifer was always right by his side, always taking care of him, doing everything she needed to be a supportive, loving partner. She was mother material. By all accounts, it seemed like Layla and Millie would be lucky to be in the care of the Rosenbaums. So, Layla and Millie's case managers, Samantha White and Tamara Warner, started the process of getting the girls into the care of the Rosenbaums. First, they ran background checks, which came back giving positive reviews of both Jennifer and Joseph. No red flags. So, they were approved for having Layla and Millie going into their home for a trial. Now, I want to note that Jennifer and Joseph were not applying to be foster parents for Layla and Millie. They were approved by the system as being fictive kin. In Georgia, fictive kin means someone who is not related to the child by marriage or blood, 
but has a substantial positive relationship with the child and is willing to take care of them. So maybe like your best friend who you've known for years and has been a big part of the child's life for years and is willing to take your child if, you know, something were to happen and you died or, you know, you also couldn't take care of your children like in Tessa's situation, you know that the care they're going to get under that friend is going to have a positive impact on their lives because they had already started growing up around this person and knows and loves them. Being a fictive kin home also has a lot less requirements than being a foster home. It's much easier to get approved because the background checks are not as intensive. But Given the definition, it's not actually really known why the Rosenbaums were being considered for fictive kin. Because again, Tessa didn't really know Jennifer. She had just briefly interacted with her as a child and the girls had never met her. She was a stranger to those girls. So we don't really know why they were considered for that. I think maybe Tessa put the okay on it and was like, I guess I knew her well enough as a child that I trust her. That could have been why, but otherwise, the Rosenbaums weren't really a part of the children's lives before taking them in, so again, we don't really know exactly why they were approved for this, but despite this, the girls' case workers still thought that the Rosenbaums were a good fit for them. They were the ideal situation. So, they went ahead with the process of transferring care over to them. This started by doing overnight stays with the Rosenbaums while still under the care of the Lamberts. So, they lived with the Lamberts but would just spend the night with the Rosenbaums like every other day or for a couple days in a row and then would go back to the Lamberts. During these overnight stays though, Patricia Lambert expressed to DCFS that they were concerned that the Rosenbaums were not watching the girls closely enough. Patricia told DCFS about a bruise she found on Layla's leg, but Jennifer explained how she got the bruise, saying that it was from when Layla got into a fight with another little girl at daycare. Jennifer was informed of the complaint against her, and Jennifer promised that she would take their advice and would be sure to watch the girls more closely while in their care. Again, Jennifer she did not have a child of her own. She had never had a child, so this was something that was new to her. So, this wasn't a huge red flag. It was more of just like, hey, she tripped and fell or something happened. You need to keep a closer eye on her, but that was really it. There was no other, like, major red flags. The process continued, and although Layla would sometimes show up with minor bruises, none of them were reported in incident reports because they didn't seem very serious. They were usually caused by fights between Layla and other children at daycare, which honestly made sense. Layla would sometimes act out because of how unstable her life was. She had thrown tantrums and pulled her sister's hair in front of caseworkers, so they knew that she was prone to behavioral issues. Samantha and Tamara even contacted the school to confirm the stories, and they confirmed that Layla sometimes got into altercations. So, despite the minor worry from the Lamberts, everything seemed to be going relatively smooth with the Rosenbaums. So, by late July of 2015, Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum were officially approved to take the girls in as fictive kin. For the months that followed, as Layla and Millie's caseworkers continued to follow up in monthly visits, they found no issues. They wrote in their reports that Layla and Millie seemed happy. Jennifer and Joseph are reliable and stable and greatly love the children. The two girls shared a bunk bed in the home where they lived in a nice, quiet neighborhood. They were even helping the girls with their school and learning. Reports from the caseworkers say that Layla has already come a long way even after only a few months. She can count better thanks to help from Jennifer. She appeared happy and comfortable. She felt safe in her new environment. Once again, Layla was continuing to act out at school, so she would have some bruises here and there, but kids get bruises sometimes. It happens. As a mandated reporter myself, there are specific places that we're supposed to be looking out for to see if there's bruises. And having a leg bruise isn't all that big of a deal, especially when the child is known to have behavioral problems. Some of my kids are super clumsy and they're not really coordinated and they have issues with motor planning. So the occasional bruise or, you know, little cut on their hand or foot isn't going to raise a red flag for me. But then by October 19th, 
2015, Layla broke her leg. She suffered from a fracture close to her knee at her tibia. Jennifer took her to an urgent care facility where she told staff that Layla had fallen at her Nana's house as well as at her gymnastics class. While at the hospital, she texted her caseworker, Samantha, saying that Layla broke her leg at gymnastics, continuing that Layla is in good spirits. She had such a positive attitude, and if you saw her at the hospital, you wouldn't even know that anything was wrong. She was singing and laughing and playing, and she didn't even cry once. Samantha did briefly follow up on this, speaking with Layla's doctors, who said that Layla was going to be okay. He didn't mention noticing any signs of abuse, and they believed the story that Layla had broken her leg at gymnastics. However, she did not follow up with the gymnastics gym to confirm the story. She also did not write an incident report for this injury. Even though they gave an explanation for the injury, if a serious injury like a broken bone happens, no matter what, a caseworker is required to write a report but Samantha didn't. I want to note that Tamara Warner had been supervising Samantha at the beginning of this case, but by this point, only Samantha was on Layla's case. I believe she was new and inexperienced, so I guess after the hard part was over, just the part of her checking up and things like that, that was handed just to Samantha. By November 2nd, Samantha paid the Rosenbaums a visit where she noticed that Millie had a bruise on her face. Some reports say that it was a black eye, while Samantha writes in her report that it was a small bruise under her eye. Jennifer explained that she left Millie in the bathroom by herself while she went and grabbed her phone in another room. While she was gone, Millie bumped her head against the faucet. Meanwhile, while Samantha was there, Layla was asleep. Jennifer said that Layla had been trouble sleeping because she was teething. Now, when completing these home visits and checking for abuse, caseworkers are supposed to undress the younger children to look for signs of abuse. Obviously, parents can put their kids in long sleeve shirts and long pants to easily cover up bruises so that when the caseworker looks directly at them, it doesn't look like anything happened. So, these caseworkers need to check under their clothes. For older kids, they don't have to do this as intensively because older kids can speak to the abuse, but again, young kids cannot. During this November 2nd visit, because Layla was sleeping, instead of doing a full physical inspection for signs of abuse, she just pulled back Layla's covers and took a quick look at her. Because again, she didn't want to wake her up. Jennifer told her that she'd had trouble sleeping, so she didn't want to disturb her when she finally fell asleep. Based on this visit, Samantha wrote in her report that Millie bumped her head on the faucet, but other than that, the children had no signs of injury or abuse. The girls were being well cared for, so no further intervention was needed. However, this would all change on November 17th, 2015, when Jennifer called 911 to report that Layla was unresponsive. She reported that Layla had choked while eating a piece of chicken. She said that she first tried the Heimlich, but was now doing CPR to save her life. She said that she got the piece of chicken out of her throat, but Layla still wasn't getting better. As she was talking, she just kept saying that Layla's eyes are closing and her eyes are rolling to the back of her head. She's turning white. She said that she's going to keep trying, she's going to do everything she can, but she doesn't want to break her ribs and she has no idea what she's doing. What's going on there? 788 radio code one. I have a toddler, a foster daughter that I just got. She was choking and I tried to do the Heimlich on her. She's still breathing, but it doesn't look good. Wait, we didn't drive. 111, we didn't drive. Call one. How old is she? Two. She's two years old. <laughs> she, is she is she is breathing now. She is breathing. I'm trying to do CPR. She keeps on going right on you. I'm hoping I didn't break a rib. I've been pushing hard. I don't really know how to do this. Okay, I'm going to give you instructions on how to do it. Is she still choking on it now? No. Okay, so it is out, so we just need to do CPR then? Yes. Okay. She's breathing, but it's not good. Please hurry. Okay, none of this is slowing them down. The dispatcher's getting them on the way. I'm going to give you instructions for you on what to do. Are you with her right now? I am. She's okay. breathing, but there, 
very low. Okay, lay the baby flat on her back, uh, on the ground. She's flat on her back. All right, move any She's pillows. On the ground. And go ahead. And there's no pillows. All right. She's flat. Look in the mouth for any food, uh, for any food or vomit. Is there anything in her mouth? Okay, place your hand on the baby's forehead, your other hand under the baby's neck and shoulders, then slightly tilt the head back. I want you to I want you to put your ear next to her mouth and tell me if you can feel or hear any breathing. I hear it. You do hear it? Yes. Okay. All right. Stay with her. Uh, make sure her head is slightly tilted back, and I want you to keep checking breathing often. I want you to, uh, starting now, every time she takes a breath in, tell me when. Just say now, every time she breathes. When? Now? Now? Okay. Now? Is it, does it matter that she's asleep? No, that's now. fine. That's fine. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. I don't know you, how to do this. I just kept trying to push and everything. You're fine. You're doing a good job. Like I said, I got help on the way to you. Okay. Aww. Yeah, we're just monitoring breathing right now. She is breathing. She just said it. She breathed again. She's breathing on that same little schedule. Okay. Yeah, she's doing fine. Like I said, we got them on the way. She just breathed again. Okay, yeah, she's doing fine. Well, do you know what she was choking on? Chicken. Okay. Said so she is asleep. Yes, but her eyes are rolled back. She is breathing, yeah. We, we make sure. She keeps telling me. Yeah, she just breathe again. Okay. She breathe again. Wait, this is so scary. Are her eyes supposed to be like rolled back? Her eyes are rolled back? Oh my God. Yeah, like I told you, like she's, her eyes are rolled back. Her, her eyes are closed, but they're rolled back. She's really pale. She is really pale now? Okay. Yeah, she's still breathing on that same schedule, but she's pale. Hey, I breathe. she's still breathing, but it doesn't sound as good as strong as it was. It doesn't sound as good as strong anymore. All right, we're going to go ahead and do CPR then. When first responders arrived, they immediately attempted life-saving efforts to hopefully bring Layla back. But as they were doing so, first responders noticed that Layla had many other injuries that could not be explained by Jennifer or first responders trying CPR. They noticed bruising to her face, neck, abdomen, back, pelvis, wrists, and legs. They noticed that her left arm looked deformed, almost as if it had been broken. It was like bowing out. He checked to see if the arm had been broken in that moment with them trying CPR and things like that. But based on his quick assessment, he felt that it had been broken previously and was in the process of healing. Obviously, when you are doing CPR, especially on a small child, things are going to happen. Bruises can happen. Broken bones can possibly happen. Because when you are trying to save someone's life, you aren't worried about breaking their bones or causing bruising. You just want them to survive. But the injuries they noticed were things that they knew were not caused by CPR. Many of them they noticed before they even started life-saving measures. So they knew that something very wrong was going on here. As they tried saving her life, she was transported to the hospital to be examined and put on life support. However, unfortunately, none of what first responders did was enough. They were unable to save Layla's life. So, on November 17th, 2015, two-year-old little Layla was pronounced dead. At this point, officers knew that Layla's death was suspicious. She had been examined by hospital staff post-mortem who found extensive external bruising. But of course, her cause of death needed to be further investigated. So, after pronouncing her as dead, by November 18th, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. And what they found is absolutely horrific. At this point in the case, I do want to give you all a warning that what this little girl went through is beyond comprehension. It's honestly making my stomach hurt now knowing what I'm about to tell you. It's very difficult to hear because it would be putting it very lightly to say that her injuries were devastating. They were 
horrible. And honestly, when I saw what these injuries were and what this little girl went through, I had never heard anything like it before. I had never heard of such horrible injuries being suffered by anybody, let alone a two-year-old child. So just take that as your warning. The medical examiner found that there were numerous bruises all over her body, spanning all the way from her head down to her legs, with the most prominent bruising being on her back. She had a massive bruise on her back that extended from her neck all the way down to her bottom. They found a total of 22 injuries on her head and neck alone. She also had a fractured leg, which we know from earlier. The fracture was on her tibia, very close to her knee though, which is very unusual for a child her age. She was also found to have a fracture to her ulna bone in her arm that was in the process of healing. Specifically, it was referred to as a nightstick fracture. This term is coined from back when law enforcement would carry nightsticks. This fracture happens when someone puts their arms up in front of their face in defense when someone is attacking them. Your ulna bone is the closest bone to your pinky, so when you hold your arms up, this is the first bone that will take the blow. This type of fracture is almost always caused by somebody being hit. This is the fracture that paramedics noticed when they first arrived to the scene. It caused her arm to look deformed, which makes sense because if she had a fracture in her arm and it was never taken care of, there was never casting done, then the way it's going to heal is how it was broken. So if the bone is sticking out like this or going in and it's never put back in place, it's never put in a cast or anything to promote healing, then it's just gonna heal like that and it's never going to straighten back out. So again, this just shows that she had a fracture that was not being taken care of. In addition to that, Layla had several broken ribs on the posterior side of her rib cage, not in the front like you'd expect from CPR. They also found several injuries to her internal organs. They found that Layla's pancreas had ruptured so bad that it was transected in half. She also had a laceration to her liver, which would have been incredibly painful for Layla and would have caused internal bleeding. That kind of injury is caused by a significant blow to the abdomen, which is a lot lower than where you would perform CPR. Even if you have absolutely zero experience in BLS and CPR, you would just know intuitively that you want to do test compressions on the chest, not on the stomach or on the lower ribs. So the CPR does not explain the significant blows to the stomach that caused such severe damage to her pancreas and liver. I also want to note that some of the injury to Layla's liver was thought to be about three weeks old at the time of her death. So even if you want to argue that the Heimlich or CPR caused some of her injuries, one of the injuries on her liver was much older. The medical examiner went on to explain that the way Jennifer described Layla's death is indicative of her having a deadly seizure. She pointed out how Jennifer said that Layla was shaking at one point and then her eyes rolled to the back of her head. She said, quote, the whole scenario is a description of a child going into shock as opposed to a child who has a foreign object such as food. The description is not consistent with that at all. The medical examiner explained that when you have blood loss, i.e. internal bleeding, this causes the body to go into shock. And that blood loss and shock can cause a seizure because your body is trying desperately to, you know, achieve homeostasis, but it's not able to. Your body is dying. In her professional opinion, the medical examiner stated that Layla suffered some sort of traumatic event about an hour before she started exhibiting these symptoms. So, to summarize and to sort of make sense of what the ME is saying, basically, an hour before that 911 call was made, Layla suffered a significant blow to her abdomen that caused some of the lacerations to her liver and pancreas. That caused internal bleeding, which then caused the body to go into shock. As a result, she had a seizure, which was explained during that 911 call. To go even further, the ME stated that she found no food or food particles in Layla's esophagus or trachea that would indicate choking. If she truly had been choking and something was lodged in her throat right before death, there would have been food debris. It's not like Jennifer got the piece unstuck and then, you know, she chugged down some water to get rid of the crumbs. 
there should have been some sign of the food being in her throat, but there wasn't any. Due to all of these findings, the medical examiner did not believe that Layla died as the result of a choking accident. Instead, she died as the result of blunt force trauma to her abdomen that caused internal bleeding and the seizure, which ultimately ended her life. She ruled that Layla's manner of death is homicide. Clearly, Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum caused her death. They abused that poor little girl, beating her until she died. Not only that, but they found that Millie suffered abuse as well. After Layla was transported to the hospital and her suspicious injuries were noted, nurses also took in Millie to examine her. They found that Millie had extensive bruises on her hip, head, arms, and her back that were all in various stages of healing. She also had extensive bruising all over her groin and buttocks area. These injuries were less severe than Layla's, but were definitely indicators of abuse. So, by December 4th, 2015, both Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum were arrested. Jennifer was charged with a 49-charge indictment including malice and felony murder, child cruelty, assault, and battery in connection with the death of Layla and the abuse of Millie. Meanwhile, Joseph was being charged with the second-degree murder, stating that he knew about the abuse and let it happen. Now, for the years that followed, police continued their investigation into this case as a whole. Obviously, the fact that Jennifer and Joseph abused these little girls in such horrific ways is just tragic and heartbreaking, but it was the Georgia DCFS system that let them care for the girls in the first place. There were so, so many warning signs, so many red flags that were missed or ignored. So, after this horrific death, an investigation was also done into DCFS and how this whole thing happened in the first place. First, they uncovered more about Jennifer's background that should have prevented her from getting guardianship to begin with. Now, like I said, when Layla and Millie's caseworkers were looking into Jennifer, they knew that she had grown up in the system. Apparently, this wasn't looked farther into because at the surface, like I said, Jennifer looked like a young woman who picked herself back up after a tough life and was determined to succeed. She was a pillar in her community. But it turned out that Jennifer and Joseph had actually applied to be foster parents two times before getting Layla and Millie into their care. Both times, they were denied because of Jennifer's background. Yes, she was a child of the foster care system and they knew that, and it turns out that it was due to her parents being homeless. But she also had been physically abused as a child, and when growing up, she also showed concerning behaviors such as anger outbursts and violence against other children. Those things automatically disqualified her from being a foster mom. But of course, when she was looked into for fictive kin, they didn't look that deep into her history, and thus she was approved. They actually only ran the background check on her married name. They did not run it for her maiden name, which is what they did previously when she applied to be a foster mom. So that is how she got denied, because in her maiden name, they found out this more extensive history that does not show up when you only look into her married name. So she never should have even been considered for kinship in the first place. But okay, that red flag was missed. I guess it happens. But after that, there were even more glaring red flags that were ignored. Millie suffered a black eye, or as stated in some reports, a bruise under her eye. There was a story to explain it away, but Samantha never looked further into it. What, do you expect the adult to come right out and be like, yeah, I hit my kid and caused her to have a black eye? That black eye should have been reported and she should have pulled Millie into another room and asked her separately. Millie was old enough to talk and to explain what happened, so Samantha should have at least asked her to see if she would confirm the story about the faucet being responsible for her black eye. Then, when it came to Millie's broken leg, once again, there was a story to explain it away. Yes, Samantha followed up with the doctor, and yes, the doctor also seemed to miss the red flag of the broken leg being in an unusual place. In the report, Samantha said that there was concern from the parent given that she was taken to the hospital for treatment for the broken leg. However, it turned out that Jennifer actually waited two days to get care for Layla's leg. 
Not only that, but when following up with the gymnastics gym, it turned out that neither Layla or Millie had ever even taken classes there. Millie had been signed up, and I believe maybe they went to the gym at some point, but she never actually took classes. And Layla herself was never even signed up. So no, she did not break her leg at gymnastics, and that was confirmed. Jennifer also mentioned that the broken leg could have happened at their Nana's house, but when they followed up with the Nana to see if they even visited on the day that they said she broke her leg, she hadn't even visited. And apparently there was this whole story of Layla falling into a hole that had been dug, that never happened either. Had her case manager taken the time to call the gym real quick or talk to Nana, she would have caught this immediately. Not only that, but regardless of how Layla got her broken leg, even if Samantha truly thought it was an accident, you know, followed up with her gymnastics gym, followed up with Nana, and they confirmed the stories, she is still required to write a serious injury report. She did not do that nobody was notified that this little girl had a broken leg. Then, as we know, there were home visits where Samantha did not do full inspections on Layla to check for injuries. We don't know how many bruises to her stomach and back could have been missed in that November visit because Samantha never checked. She was more worried about waking Layla up and believing Jennifer's story than just checking under her clothes really quick. So, putting everything together, we discussed earlier that Layla would have some random bruises on her legs. No big deal, right? She's clumsy, and she gets into fights at daycare. Okay. But then, Millie has a black eye. Accident. Then, Layla has a broken leg. Accident. I completely understand not raising the alarm when a kid has a couple of bruises a couple times. I've had kids walk into my clinic where they have a little scratch on their hand or on their foot or a bruise on their shin or on their arm, and I'm not just immediately calling CPS because it's one time or it happens occasionally and I know how clumsy this kid can be. But when there is incident after incident after incident of finding bruises and injuries, that should raise the alarm but it didn't. I get that DCFS workers are underpaid and overworked. I get that sometimes small things can slip through the cracks, and it is so unfortunate. But when there are this many mistakes made, it's unforgivable. At some point in all of this, I do believe it was Layla's biological mom, Tessa, that tried to open a lawsuit against the Georgia Department of Human Services, but as far as I have seen, that case was dismissed. Now going back to the trial for Jennifer and Joseph. After delay after delay after delay, in July of 2019, the trial for murder finally started. The prosecution came out strong, calling the Rosenbaums liars, abusers, and manipulators, saying that Jennifer's entire life is a facade. She talked about how, yes, their biological mother struggled with drug abuse. Yes, she was neglectful. But no matter how much they went through with Tessa, nothing was as bad as what happened to these poor girls when they were placed with Jennifer and Joseph. Then after only a few short months, the whole facade came crashing down and they were exposed for the abusers they are and always were. Both girls were abused horrifically. They had bumps, bruises, broken bones, and injuries, constant injuries, and each and every time these injuries were noticed by social workers or doctors, Jennifer would lie about how they happened. The most egregious lie then came on November 17th, 2015, when Jennifer called 911 to report that Layla was choking. She was on the phone with the dispatcher, making it clear that she doesn't know what she's doing and she doesn't want to hurt her, already trying to come up with her story of how Layla got all those bruises. Then, when first responders got to the scene, they found that there was nothing lodged in her throat. She was never choking. Then, when trying to work on her, they immediately saw the bruises. They immediately knew that this was not a choking. This was the result of a horrific, brutal beating. It was a beating so bad that she had broken bones, heavy bruising, head to toe, organ damage, internal bleeding, all so bad that she had a seizure that ended her 
life. Then, once Layla died, the doctors examining her found even more severe bruising. She had bruises on her abdomen, way lower than you would ever try CPR. Even if you are completely inexperienced at any sort of healthcare, you know not to do CPR down by your belly button. She had bruises on her groin as well, most likely from being kicked between the legs, as we would later hear from Millie. Millie said that being kicked between the legs and on the butt was a common punishment in their home. Layla also had abrasions and bruising to her inner thighs. She had bruises not only to the sides and back of her head, which could be explained by her just being clumsy, but she also had bruises to the very top of her head most likely from suffering blows directly from above. No one's just gonna fall directly on their head. That does not make sense. Even further, the bruises she did have were not consistent with a bruise that a two-year-old would suffer from falling. She had bruises to her hips, back of her legs, and down towards her knees. Then, the most extensive bruises were to her back, most likely from blows to the back. These bruises were all in completely different stages of healing, so no, they weren't all caused from CPR. If they were caused from one instance of pressure, they would all look fresh. But again, they didn't. Some were old bruises, some were new. It was from long-term abuse. Then, as I stated before, Layla had suffered multiple fractures. She broke her tibia, which we know didn't happen at gymnastics. She was never even signed up for gymnastics. We know she had a nightstick fracture in her ulna, which doctors testified are almost always from being hit blunt force trauma. Then, after her death, we found out that she had several fractures in her posterior ribs, which again, you could argue that when you're giving CPR, you might break a few ribs. However, it is usually expected that you would break the anterior ribs or the ribs in front, not the ones on the posterior side or her back. Then, to go further, those ribs were actually in stages of healing, when she was murdered. So no, they were not from CPR, they were from a prior episode of abuse. Then again, as you know, her internal organs were damaged. Your liver is located behind your ribs and then your pancreas is just behind your liver. The bruising on her abdomen shows that she was hit, kicked, or stomped on with such force that the blow went through her ribs, your bones that are literally there for the specific purposes of protecting your organs, and went to the liver and pancreas and literally transected it. I cannot stress that enough. Again, your ribs are designed to protect your organs. To be hit so hard that your pancreas transects is an unbelievable amount of force exerted on this two-year-old little baby. Not only that, but she had organ injuries that were actually healed. So no, this wasn't just caused from really, really intense CPR. It was from a long history of abuse. She had several other organs damaged from past episodes of abuse. So if I'm not making myself clear enough, she was horrifically abused. And again, Millie was also covered in bruises. She had bruises on one side of her face and then on her neck on the other side. So again, that proved that she didn't get the bruises from falling on one side of her face. Like if you fell and hit your head or your face or something like that and you had bruises like all on one side, that would kind of make sense. But she didn't. She was smacked on one side and then hit again on the other. She had bruising, all over her forearms. She had severe black and blue bruises all over her hip, buttocks, and the insides of her legs. Again, all in various stages of healing, not something you would get from a fall. She also had bruises to her groin from being kicked in between the legs. She also had a healing fracture to her elbow. So, did she get all those bruises from CPR too? Did Jennifer give Millie CPR while she didn't really need it? No it's obvious that they were both abused. At the trial, multiple doctors who had seen Layla prior to her death, as well as emergency staff, all testified about the bruising and other injuries she had. All of these injuries pointed to abuse. I won't go through too much of what they said because we already discussed the injuries in great detail, but just to reiterate, they noticed that all of the injuries were in various stages of healing. 
they knew that the types of fractures the girls suffered were unusual and not typically caused by accidents. The injuries and bruising were not in places that are typical in children who are just clumsy and getting into spiffs at school. Trust me, even if another kid had beaten the absolute crap out of Layla at school, no child would be able to exert the amount of force required for the injuries she had. Little Millie, now seven years old at this time, also testified at trial. So she was seven at the trial, not right now. She talked about how Jennifer and Joseph would yell loudly at her and Layla whenever they got mad. She said that Jennifer got mad about a lot of things. They would get hit or kicked for things like falling asleep in the car or not getting dressed fast enough. Then Millie talked about the night that Layla died. She said that she finished up dinner and went upstairs to watch Paw Patrol. Jennifer called her from the bottom of the stairs to come down. When she came down, she saw that Layla was sleeping. And immediately, she got into the car with Jennifer and went to the hospital. That was the night that Layla had died. She said that she gets really sad when talking about Layla's death. At trial, they also had a supervisor of the workers from the CPS case talk about all of the missteps that happened in the case. She talked about how, yes, they missed a lot and none of this should have ever happened. Jennifer never should have been approved as a fictive kin parent. She talked about how the staff did not screen Jennifer under her maiden name and if they had, they would have seen the red flags from her childhood. She also said that the home authorization done for the Rosenbaums was signed by someone who was not authorized to sign it. Samantha's supervisor, Tamara, said that Samantha White was inexperienced and didn't report things like she should have, such as the broken leg. The girl's great-grandmother also testified at trial. She talked about how she fought to get custody of those little girls from the time that they were babies and still in Tessa's care. She was the one point of stability the girls had in their lives, but she was living in an assisted living facility and I don't think she had the ability to live on her own and the assisted living facility did not allow children. So eventually, she had to give up the fight for custody and that is when these girls were placed into foster care. She said that initially, when the girls were placed with the Rosenbaums, she was excited because they looked good on paper. However, the Rosenbaums started limiting the interaction that the girls could have with their great-grandmother. When she did see them, she was concerned because she did see some bruising on them. She started the process of fighting for them back again, even getting the senior living facility to allow them to live there for two years. But as soon as she started contacting DCFS, it was too late because Layla was dead. And that is something else that I want to point out, is that Jennifer and Joseph literally only had Layla for a few months, literally less than four months before she was killed. So really, the abuse started immediately and got progressively worse. The rate at which this abuse got bad is just gut-wrenching and sickening. On the other hand, like I've been mentioning all throughout the video, the defense came in and said that all of the injuries Layla suffered were from CPR. They said that the Rosenbaums are a kind, loving family. They reiterated that Joseph is a good provider working two jobs. Meanwhile, Jennifer is a third-year law student. Jennifer would take the girls to her law school any chance she got. The court showed the jurors pictures of them smiling with the girls at home and in those professional family photos that you would get at JCPenney. They showed pictures of the girls with Jennifer at school. Smiling children in photos? That doesn't happen with parents who abuse their kids ever. It's obviously a sign that they were not abused because they were smiling for photos. They said that all of this was just a horrible accident that started with Layla choking and then Jennifer trying CPR and having no idea what to do. I guess she thought her heart was in her low stomach and then in the mess of it all, she accidentally broke her arm and her leg, several ribs, gave her bruising to her head, arms, legs, groin, neck, and back, and also transected an organ and damaged several more. Guys, Jennifer was just trying CPR on every single one of Layla's body parts to make sure that she got the right one because she doesn't know where your heart is. She has no idea what she was doing. If the stomach doesn't work, why not try CPR on her head? Surely that will get her breathing. If that doesn't work, why not try it on her arm? Maybe that'll get something going. 
If it sounds stupid and ridiculous, that's because it is. Friends and family members of the Rosenbaums testified at trial, all confirming just how great of people they are. Friends said that they trusted Jennifer to babysit in the past, and they still would if they needed it. I guess they really hate their kids, huh? Basically, everyone who knew them said that they were surprised about all of this and that they just did not seem like the type who would hurt these little girls. The defense also tried really hard to make Millie look like a liar when she testified, which yes, her counselor and therapist did say that Millie would make up stories and embellish stories as a way to cope with what she went through. She was literally four when all of this happened and that is what little kids will do but that doesn't mean that she made up the abuse. She is clearly a traumatized, abused little girl, and I think it's disgusting that the defense chose to take the route of making Millie out to be a little seven-year-old liar. It's it's really disgusting. At the end of the trial, both sides made their closing arguments, and let me say that this prosecutor was fun to watch throughout the entire trial because she is a spitfire. She takes no bullshit, she says it how it is, and I can just hear in the way she talks that she is as disgusted as the rest of us are with Jennifer and Joseph. After the closing arguments, the jury went in for deliberations, and it didn't take long before they came back with their verdict. They found Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum guilty on almost all 49 counts the two faced. For Jennifer, this included felony murder, aggravated assault, and cruelty to children. For Joseph, he was found guilty for second-degree murder, aggravated assault, and first-degree cruelty to children. Again, there were multiple counts of each charge, and one of the charges for Jennifer was malice murder, but she was actually found not guilty for that one. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's come to my attention that you have reached a verdict in this case. Is that correct? It is. All right. Would you please publish your verdict to the court? In other words, read it. For count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, not guilty. Count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, not guilty. Count three, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, guilty. Count six, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, guilty. Count seven, Aggravated battery. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, guilty. Count eight, murder in the second degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joseph Michael Rosenbaum, guilty. Count nine, cruelty to children in the second degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joseph Michael Rosenbaum, guilty. Count 15, cruelty to children in the first degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joseph Michael Rosenbaum, guilty. Count 16, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, guilty. Count 17, cruelty to children in the first degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jennifer Michelle Rosenbaum, guilty. At the sentencing hearing, Layla's birth mother, Tessa, testified about just how hurt she was from this. She knew that she wasn't in the best place to raise her children, so she was happy when they were placed with Jennifer. And she has blamed herself for four years because of how her actions led them to being in the care of these monsters. Um, I'm Layla's mom. And I just wanted to say that um, they were given the opportunity to have a really precious baby in their life. And instead they took her life. And I've, I've blamed myself over the last four years a lot for what's happening to my baby because of my actions that caused her to be in their home. But I just want to say that now I see that I don't have to blame myself anymore because I never hurt my babies. I love them very much. 
and I just hope that the time that they do in there, I hope that they really have time to feel something. I hope that they can feel something. And Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being here. On the other hand, the family of Jennifer and Joseph are in complete denial. They have heard the details of this trial, yet they still believe that they were loving foster parents and that they cared about Layla. They even said that they are so broken about the horrible accident that caused Layla's death. Joseph's mom said that they were both good parents, that they would never do anything to hurt Layla, and that this was an accident, and she does not care what anybody says. She doesn't care what evidence there is. She doesn't care, you know, what glaring red flag she is seeing. She's ignoring it. She's choosing to ignore all of it. So, she asked for leniency, saying that she's worried that her son will die in prison because he's not getting the care that he needs for his health condition. And all I have to say is good. I hope he suffers every single day. You don't want your son to die? What about that two-year-old little baby that died under their care? I am not going to play their speeches because it's infuriating and this whole case has been frustrating enough, so I'm not going to put you through that. After hearing from the different family members, it was time for the judge to speak. In the sentencing, he said that it is deeply frustrating to hear how the Rosenbaum's family members disagree with the verdict. He said that the case was carefully tried and he is concerned at the lack of recognition for the scope of this case. It was not an accident and it is mind-blowing how you can hear these details in this case and still be that delusional. The judge said that this was one of the worst, most horrific crimes that he has ever experienced. The look on his face when he's speaking about the family just speaks for himself. He is dumbfounded. Let me just also add, uh, that it is deeply frustrating for the court to hear family members of the defendants quarrel with the verdict that was rendered in this case. This case was carefully tried. And I'm deeply concerned of the lack of recognition on behalf of the defendant's family of the scope of the tragedy and of the cause of the tragedy. I've lived with this case for a long time, too. And I will tell you that it is one of the worst, most horrible crimes and outcomes that anyone could ever experience or dream of experiencing. And so, I just want to say that I feel for and deeply pained by your loss. And I hope that you will somehow find a way to recover. In the end, Jennifer was handed down a life sentence plus 40 years behind bars. Then Joseph was given a sentence of 30 years behind bars. As to count six, you'll be sentenced to a term of life in prison. As to count 10 through 41, will be sentenced to a term of 20 years to serve. Those 20 years will be served concurrent with each other and consecutive to the sentence pronounced in count number six. As to counts 42 through 47, will be sentenced to a term of 20 years. Those sentences will run concurrent with each other and consecutive to count number 10. All told, this is a life sentence. Uh, plus 40 years to serve in the state penitentiary. You 
You may be seated. Mr. Joseph Rosenbaum, please stand. It will be the order and judgment of this court to be sentenced to a term of 30 years in the state penitentiary as to counts 12, 13, 14, 15, 18, 19, 22, 23, 26, 27, 30, 31, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47. You will be sentenced to a term of 20 years to serve in the state penitentiary. All told, yours is a 50-year sentence with 30 years to serve in the state penitentiary. The sentence having been pronounced, uh, you uh, may have a seat. For those of you wondering, after all of this, Millie is now in the care of an adoptive mother who, by all accounts, loves her and treats her well. She takes her to therapy. She seems kind and patient and fully willing to take on all that comes with a child who lived through what Millie did. All I can do is hope for the absolute best for Millie and hope that she turns out okay. So that is the information that I have on today's case. It's obviously a horrific one one of the most horrific that I've covered to this date. But one thing I did want to talk about and point out again is that they only had these girls for four months before Layla died. Jennifer went out of her way to get these girls from Tessa. So to me, I have to wonder why. As I stated, Jennifer remembered Tessa from their time in foster care, but Tessa didn't remember Jennifer. We also heard from the neighbors of Jennifer that before getting the girls, she mentioned to the neighbor that Tessa is a meth head, so now she's taking care of her meth babies. Obviously, not a way you should be talking about the two little girls you are so excited and proud to get. So, with that said, I wonder, did Tessa do something to Jennifer in foster care that Jennifer's just been stewing about all these years? Did Tessa say something to Jennifer or treat her in a way that she's upset about? Because maybe Tessa did something to Jennifer that was significant for Jennifer, but insignificant to Tessa, and that's maybe why Jennifer remembered her and Tessa didn't. Maybe Tessa made an offhand comment, maybe she bullied her or made fun of her, who knows? But I wonder, did Jennifer take those girls and abuse them to get revenge on Tessa? I think it's possible. Or did Jennifer just have this deep insecurity where she hated herself so much that she wanted to take it out on someone smaller and weaker? As we heard from before, they did try to be foster parents before Layla and Millie. Was it her plan all along to have someone in her house to take all of her anger out on? Did Jennifer just feel so insecure and so insignificant that the only way to take it out was on someone weaker than her? Because to me, you don't just immediately get kids and start abusing them right away for no reason. It's never okay, but in some cases like this, you hear about how it happened slowly over years, that the child got out of control and they didn't know what to do, so they took their anger and frustration out on the child. Again, it is not okay. That does not make it okay. That does not make it any more acceptable, but it at least explains how it happened. With this case, it seems like she went out of her way. She did not have to take these girls. She went out of her way, found someone, messaged them on Facebook, and then she took in those girls. And to me, I feel like she had the full intention of hurting them the entire time. And I don't think she would have stopped until one of them died. I think that it was just getting worse and worse and she was trying to figure out what she can get away with. Because another part to this case is that Jennifer did grow up in the system. She knew what those CPS workers were going to be looking for. So she specifically chose areas to abuse these children in ways that she knew CPS would not catch if she played her cards right. She knew that it was harder to find those bruises if she kicked him between the legs or smacked him on the back or on the top of the head. She knew that these bruises were not going to be obvious and I think she meticulously chose where she was going to hurt those children. I think she was calculated. I think she did all of this on purpose. I think she wanted those girls to see what she could get away with. Maybe she was abused herself. Maybe her foster parents also harmed her in the same way 
that she harmed those girls. It doesn't excuse it, it doesn't make it okay, but I think that might have something to do with why she chose to hurt these little girls in the way that she did. I also think that the more she got away with it, the worse it got and the more confident she got. It's just crazy to think that she abused these girls so badly and that it was not caught by the caseworkers and I think that just made her more confident, more cocky, and made her feel better, made her feel like she was more able to hurt these girls even worse. And again, I just think it really just boosted her ego every time she wasn't caught. That being said, I think she took joy in all of this. I think she enjoyed hurting those girls. I can't think of any other explanation. And for Joseph's part, I don't know if he partook or not. Based on the trial, it seems like most of the abuse came from Jennifer, but obviously Joseph had to know about it and went along with it. If he wanted it to stop, he could have stopped it by reporting it. He is just as culpable as her, and I'm really happy that the courts took this case seriously enough that they gave him second degree murder as well instead of just like child abuse or something like that because that is setting a precedent that if you do not report abuse that you are witnessing that if you take any part in it whatsoever that you are also just as responsible. Neither Lila or Millie deserved any of this. It's absolutely tragic and heartbreaking how these bottom-feeding, low-life pieces of trash were ever even able to get those girls in their care. And just as with any case like this, there isn't much that we can do about the past. We can't go back and change what happened. But I sincerely hope that cases like this one encourage social workers and mandated reporters to do better. Recognize the red flags and do what you can to prevent this from happening children that you care for. My heart absolutely breaks for Millie and Layla and everyone who loved those little girls. Layla deserved so much more in her life and I just wish she could have gone on to survive this and went with the family who is actually going to care for her, but there's nothing we can do to change it now. But that's what I think about all of this. I've shared my thoughts. Now I want to hear what you all think about all of this. Why do you think this happened? Do you agree with what I said or do you have another explanation? What do you think of their families sticking by their sides through all of this? Let's discuss this and any other comments that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.